many people here have like heard of CopyScript? Pretty much everyone, half the people. How many people have actually used it in a project? One. <laughs> okay, well, um, CopyScript is um, basically turns JavaScript into like assembly language. So you, you write your code in CopyScript in a copy file. You run a little compiler program and it creates perfectly formed JavaScript for you. Um, the JavaScript that it creates is um, just bog standard JavaScript, but it's all, it does all the right things, all the little tricks and um, things you, you are too lazy to do when you write JavaScript yourself, it does for you, which is nice. So um, just to show you some, uh, there's a lot of code, so if you guys can't see, you wanna move up front, don't be shy. Um, the top part is CopyScript, so it, it kind of turns JavaScript into looking more like Ruby. So for comments, you have you know, a hash sign to start a comment. Um, you can do block comments. You can do assignments, so Cylon score equals 123. That looks just like JavaScript. And you can see down here what it's actually outputting for that piece of code. So Line seven is unchanged, Cylon score equals 123. That's JavaScript. The next line is doing a comparison to see if Cylon score is between 150 and 200. So it's just a nice little convenience method which gets broken up into two comparisons down in the JavaScript part. And this part I really like is it has here docs, which Ruby has. So you can put a whole bunch of stuff between three quotes and also interpolate variables into your text and that gets converted into JavaScript. Um, and you can do things like this on top. So you can say, uh, you can have your if statements at the end of a line, just like in Ruby. Um, you can also iterate through things by saying for variable name in um, array and it'll iterate through that. So you can see the JavaScript down here that it's creating. It's using a standard JavaScript for loop, gets the link, iterates through it, and fires the laser at the target. But as you can see, the top is much more readable. Can't read all of it, unfortunately, but um, it looks a lot like Ruby. This is declaring a function in JavaScript, uh, or in CopyScript. So the top, we're creating a silent detector function. You actually leave off the word function in CopyScript. You don't need it. Um, you use the parens for passing arguments, then the little arrow sign. And it's, uh, it's like Python in that it, it, um, indentation is important, and that's how it signifies blocks. You don't have to use um, braces or anything. So we just indent the next line, we say person name is Sharon. And that's gonna evaluate into a true or false statement. And it returns it automatically just like Ruby does. So in Ruby, you don't have to explicitly say return X, Y, Z. You just put your condition at the end, at the end of your function and it gets returned. So you can see down here, what did it actually do? Well, it declared our variable for us, created the function and then returned the, um, Boolean. The next one has another neat function where you can do um, or equals, just like in Ruby. So if result is already defined, it'll return that. Otherwise, it'll assign result to the result of the DNA test. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, you, you would, yeah. I mean, it, it's definitely not that smart, the, the compiler. Like, it's, it's just kind of using text munging to convert this syntax into JavaScript syntax. Um, it has the concept of an existence, the question marks, you can check for the existence of a variable. Um, 
which in JavaScript you have to say type of blah is undefined and is it null and all this stuff. And it just, you know, makes it a lot more clean and readable for you. And of course you never actually do that stuff because you're too lazy. So this way it forces you to, to use JavaScript in the right way. Okay, this is um, another thing you can do in Ruby is you can um, return an array that gets split up and assigned to an array of values. So if I have a function called get coordinates and it returns an array lat long, then I can just immediately assign lat long to the result of that function and it, it does the right thing. Would have to create some intermediate variables and things to make that all happen, but it does it for you behind behind the scenes. Uh, I don't think so. Another cool thing that CoffeeScript can do is it has the concept of splats, which are these three dots, which can do things like this. So if I take tag split and I split that string tag, it splits it into an array of all the different characters and the open will match the first character, close will match the last character, contents dot 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 will match everything in between. So the, con the variable contents will actually contain the word impossible. And you can see it takes a lot of actual JavaScript to make that happen. Um, you can also soak up nulls, which um, is really useful when you're traversing a whole long line of uh, object attributes. You can use the question mark to question mark dot, and it'll soak it up instead of giving you, giving you an error when you try and reference that. This um, is another thing where CoffeeScript is kind of giving you some Ruby-esque type abilities. So what, what you do in Ruby, especially Rails, is you, you're a lot, you're all, you're passing in this uh, option hash as your last argument. Um, so you can do that here in CoffeeScript. So the options dot 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 will soak up anything you you pass to it. Um, it doesn't just have to be one argument. So you if you pass it all those foo, bar, unique, it'll make all those available as an options hash for you. Just like, you know, Rails would. You can see how much JavaScript it takes to make that happen, where here it's just seamless. But the coolest, that was all kind of just convenient um, but this is the part that really, really, um, that, that I really started using it for. And that's being able to, to kind of create these pseudo classes in CoffeeScript where uh, creating classes the right way in JavaScript is, you know, it just doesn't fit in my brain. I'm not sure exactly how it works even to this day. So this way I can just write my classes like I would in Ruby and they work the way I expect them to. So here we have a, an example of, let's say you, you want to um, run a web form. So I create my class. I have a constructor where I'm going to pass in an element that this piece of code works on. So it would be a div, probably. Um, I set up the, what the base element is. Then I do some standard things like bind the key down uh, event to an on key method set the submit to an AJAX submit, and then have a clear function that's going to clear 
And at the bottom, this is the most important part, is what, what happens in CoffeeScript is it wraps everything you do inside an anonymous function. Every CoffeeScript file that you create, when it creates the JavaScript file through the compiler, it, it wraps it in an anonymous function. And it does that so you don't end up polluting the namespace, which is another big problem in JavaScript. So because you're wrapped, you can't get to the outside. You can't access anything outside, or nothing outside can access you. So basically, you just attach things to the window that you want to be able to get out elsewhere. So I, I attach my class to the window so that later on, I can reference window.webform and get to my class. So this, let's say this is a generic um, base class I'm going to use for my web form. Now I want to create a, a, a sign-up form that's going to extend that class so it inherits all the same methods and properties of that class. And then I can override them and also have access to super. So here for the constructor, I just call super and I do some other special thing that I need to do just for the sign-up form. And also the sign-up form, when you clear it, it does standard stuff, plus it clears some text fields. So now you can make changes to the base class, and they, all your other classes will inherit all those changes. Here's how you might use something like that. You have a div that's a sign-up div, and your form elements are all inside there. And then this part is where you're actually instantiating uh, your new class. So you have to reference it with window dot sign up form. You pass it whatever the base element is. And then it just operates on your form. And uh, this is what the sign up form actually looks like in JavaScript once you've compiled it. So you know, I, don't, I, I couldn't look at that and just immediately tell what it does, but it's a lot easier to tell what it does when it's in its CoffeeScript form. But this you know, sets up the prototype chain and does all this funky stuff that you need to do in JavaScript to make that work. But it is still just JavaScript, so if there's any you need to go in there and see what it's doing or debug it. I mean, it's right there. Now, there's a lot of reasons to hate it. Um, you know, it's, it's definitely another step. And when you are debugging in your browser, you're looking at the JavaScript, not the copy script. And, you know, it's, it's kind of a hassle that way. They, they do have kind of a cool... Uh, toy where you can send CoffeeScript to the browser and the browser will compile it on the fly. But, they, you know, nobody would really probably do that in production right now. But um, that's probably the biggest problem we've run into is just working around that. But it's really allowed us to better organize the JavaScript that's in our projects by using the CoffeeScript. Um, how many... I do have um, another thing I can show you where we've used CoffeeScript to build an iPhone app. Um, so I, ha I can just quickly show you a, a demo of how we did that. But if you want to know more about CoffeeScript, this has like the best documentation website I've ever seen. It's, it's phenomenal. You go to co coffeescript.com and they have uh, a button there. You can actually just type in CoffeeScript and it shows you what the JavaScript is on the, on the other side. So it's um, it's, it's a good read. Um. Has anyone used titanium or is familiar with titanium? Titanium is a, basically a way to write a native iPhone app using JavaScript. And it's not, it actually uses native um, C widgets. It's not just using a web view and showing 
uh, web content on the phone. It's, it's actually being compiled down into Objective C code. But one of the one of the problems with Titanium is just organizing your code is it's it's really messy. It's, there's no good way to do namespacing and just organize all your JavaScript. So we've been using CopyScript to write the JavaScript that goes into the Titanium project, and it's really helped us, you know, organize things better. So for example, here's a um, Here's an app we're going to create. And the first thing we have to do is create a root object, which will then, everything will tie to the root so we can get at it. Because like I said, everything in CopyScript is wrapped, not an anonymous function. So I include a generic window and a main window. So the generic window is just um, our base class. So we'll have a constructor which sets up the title and the text. Um, we create some... Uh, iPhone UI objects, some labels, give it a font size, add it to the window, set up an event listener on a click. It's going to call a function, alert. And then my main app basically sets up, um, uses that generic window to create two uh, instances of that window, attaches them to a tab group. And then it plays your, your iPhone out. So I guess the point of that was just to show how little code it really takes to build an iPhone app and how CopyScript helped us um, kind of organize it better. Yeah? Uh, are lines 8 through 10 like the treatment object in JavaScript? Yes. Yes. So you, you could, in JavaScript, you would have a parens a curly brace, some commas, and then an ending curly brace and a parent. So it kind of just gets rid of that line noise, you know, and everything works off indentation, which if you're a Python program, you'll love. Yeah, and, and, and it, it, it does have this compilation step, but everything else we're doing has that too. We're using Sass, we're using Haml. Like all these things get generated then into my public, so why not my JavaScript too? That was... Did you have a question? Uh, a couple of questions. Does the play world come in um, Well, the, the resulting JavaScript is just JavaScript. So it, I mean, there's, I wouldn't have found. No, nothing. I mean, we use it with jQuery, with prototype, with underscore. Um, Um, yeah, basically. So CoffeeScript comes with it, it, you install it as a node as a node package, and it comes with a copy command, which will watch a directory and just spit out everything to public, or just like um, you know SAS does with your CSS. Um, well, with the titanium thing, like, it doesn't really affect how the Objective-C gets, gets generated. Um, so I, I don't see it. It hasn't affected us all there. I mean, but that, that's the main problem with titanium is, yeah, it's, there's kind of this black box, and I'm writing this JavaScript, and then who knows what's happening, and out comes this Objective-C, which I don't really have a lot of visibility into. So 
I, I definitely wouldn't do anything complex with it, but for your just standard, you know, restaurant menu app or something, like it's, it works awesome. Like we do it in one tenth the time it would take to do it in Objective C. And you can easily shell out a web view to, to do anything you want with mobile web stuff, jQuery mobile or, you know, whatever. You're even storing the assets locally on the phone and just running them on the browser in the phone. Okay? Thanks.